praise your holy name, Lord Jesus. You are a great God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, did you come to praise him this morning? Amen. Did you come to get warm this morning? <laughs> it's kind of cold outside, isn't it? <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is here, and he's going to bring his fire, and we're just going to be toasty this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we're so glad, Lord Jesus, to be in your house this morning. We're so glad to know that you are king of heaven and king of earth, Lord Jesus. We're so glad to know that you rule and you reign in heaven and earth, Lord Jesus. And there is nothing that escapes your grasp, Lord. Lord, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and we worship you and we praise you, Lord Jesus. We invite you into our service, Lord Jesus. And we just pray that you will show up, Lord Jesus, in a mighty and powerful way to bless your people, Lord Jesus. And we ask it in your name. Amen.
praise, Lord Jesus. We lift our hands to you, Lord. We give you all that we have this morning, Lord Jesus. Just thank you, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. Just lift our hands to you, Lord. Just fill us, Lord. Just fill us, Worship you, God of mercy and grace. 
holy with our voices. And holy, holy is our God Almighty. And holy, holy is His name alone. And holy, holy is our God Almighty. And holy, holy is His name. Let's sing that again. Holy. And holy, holy is our God Almighty. And holy, holy is His name alone. And holy, holy is our God Almighty. And holy, holy is His name alone. As we Our praises are for this morning, Lord. Let our eyes just be set on your glory, Lord, for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Lord, just how holy you are, Lord. Holy, holy is our God Almighty, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, just Lord, how great you are.
number one this morning, Joshua chapter three and verse one. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, And the priest, who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it, Joshua told the people. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for the presence of Jehovah who desires to do amazing things within all of our lives. Lord, help us to see and to understand that we shortchange ourselves so many times when we fail to view the greatness and the goodness of our God. And the fact, Lord, that you want us, as I've just read this passage concerning Joshua and Israel, you want us to cross over into your promise, over into your blessings, over into your abundance, Lord, if we will just act upon your word, if we will just believe, as the word says, all things are possible. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will be exalted through the proclamation of your word today. And Lord, we'll give you thanks and praise and blessing. For we ask it in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is our fourth message in this Sunday morning series that we have been in, entitled Promise Versus Possession. And I stress to you that it's one thing to have a promise given, and it's entirely something else to possess that promise. 
The truth of the matter is you and I have more promises given by God to us than we can even begin to wrap our minds and hearts around. But yet most of us are not appropriating those promises and living in the blessing of those promises that God desires. We talked about several things since we began this message. I began it with a message entitled, Are You a Joshua or a Moses? Then we moved to preparation precedes possession. And then in our last time together, it was possession begins with a scarlet cord. And it was how God worked through Rahab the harlot, not only to bring Israel into the promised land, But God put a harlot in the lintage of the Son of God. Listen to me when I tell you only God could do that. And only God can take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. Which brings us to the message this morning, our fourth message, which I've entitled, It's Time to Cross Over. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you ready to cross over? Are you ready to begin a new journey? Are you ready to enter into the promise of God? Are you ready to see amazing things happen in your life? Are you ready to experience the power of God like you've never experienced it in all of your life? My point is this, church. Moses, if you will remember, sent spies out some 40 years earlier to spy out this land. Twelve of them. Forty years later, Joshua sends two more spies out to spy out this same land. My point is this. Israel had spied out the land long enough. Israel had pondered the promise long enough. They had spent the last 40 years thinking about the promise that God had made to them. Listen to me when I tell you, you can ponder all you want, but there comes a time and a point in your life when you've got to get yourself up and stop measuring the odds and start moving out in faith believing. When you go to school... College, you meet two kind of people there. Well, you may meet more than two, I don't know, but. But you meet two kind of people there. There are those who go to college, and the only thing on their mind is I want to get done with my education so I can get on with my career. And then there are those who are at college who want their education to be their career. We call them professional students. Listen to me when I tell you, Israel had been a professional student long enough. They had been sizing up the promised land for the past 40 years. They had sent out spies twice to spy out the same land. Now it's time for them to get up and move out and take hold of the promise. And let me tell you, the Holy Spirit said to me this morning that there's some people sitting in this sanctuary this morning who would be sitting in this sanctuary this morning and you have been sizing up and you have been pondering the promises and the blessing of God. But now it's time for you to step out and start acting upon the promises of God instead of just thinking about the promises and sizing up the promises and spying out the promises. God says to you and I today, it's time to get up and cross over to the other side. There's one more thing that I want you to see here, and that is the difference in the two reports that came back. We won't turn there, but let me read just a verse to you from Numbers 13. When Moses sent out the 12 spies, this is the report they came back with. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities fortified and very large. 
Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot attack those people. They are stronger than we are. If you're still in the text, flip one chapter back to chapter 2, and let me read just one verse of the two spies who went this time sent by Joshua. This was their report. Then they said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. The first spies came back and said, there's no possible way we can do this. The two spies came back and said, we can certainly do this. The people's hearts are melting with fear and we must move now. Listen to me when I tell you, contrary to what Israel thought, their problem was not the giant that live there. Their issue was not the fortified cities that existed. It was not the impossibility of the task laid before them. Their problem was they needed like us to stop talking about the greatness of the enemy and start declaring the greatness of our God who has called us and commissioned us to take the land. Three things very quickly. Larry, if you can turn this down just a little bit. It feels like it's about ready to peek out there on me. The first thing I want you to see is the miracles promised. Look at verse 5 with me of our text, if you will. The miracles promised. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Listen to me, church, when I tell you God did not say I'll do good things. I'll do commendable things. I'll do average things. The Lord wants to do amazing things in their life. And he wants to do amazing things in our lives. Someone has rightly said it's a sin to settle for good things whenever God has promised great things. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16 says this. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted, established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Listen to this. That you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we are able to ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Think about that verse of scripture I just read to you. God says that we can experience a love that surpasses all knowledge, all understanding. He says we can receive the measure of the fullness of, of God. Listen to me, there's no question that God is working in some of our lives, and I hope all of our lives. That's not really the question. The question is, is the fullness of God working in our lives? Is the fullness of God being seen and experienced within our lives? Listen to me whenever I tell you, church, the only thing that prevents amazing things from happening in your life and mine is not the size of the giants, uh, not the size of the mountain before us, not the number that are against us, but our ability to believe in the power and the greatness of our God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he will reward those who earnestly seek him. Listen to me. If you go on to read that 11th chapter, you will read where faith subdued kingdoms, where faith raised the dead, where faith healed the sick, where faith stopped the forces that would come against them. Listen to me when I tell you the only thing that stops us from enjoying the promises of God is our inability to believe that he is able to do what he promised 
to do. The miracles that were promised. Second thing that I want you to see in our text is not only the miracles that were promised, but the message that was proclaimed. The message just prior to Joshua and Israel crossing over the Jordan. There's actually three messages given there. Look with me at our text of verse 3 at the first message that is given to them. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are the Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark, and do not grow near it. I want you to notice two things about God's presence. Look back there with me, and the first thing I want you to see is the phrase that says, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest who are the Levites carrying it, you are to move out of your positions and follow it since you have never been this way before. We talked about the Ark of the Covenant and the importance of the Ark of the Covenant even in this series we've talked about it. The Ark of the Covenant was a wooden box that was made and inside that wooden box were three items. There was the Ten Commandments given to Moses on the mountain. There was Aaron's rod that had budded and then there was a golden pot of manna. And those three items were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, and then it was covered over by what is called the mercy seat of God. On either side of the mercy seat, there were two golden angels that guarded the presence of God because it, it was right between these two angels where the presence of God was abiding with his people. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ was an important vocal point in Israel's life and history. And we've talked about that, that, that the truth of the matter is the presence of God needs to be so very, very important to you and I. Listen to me, church. There is nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, that you and I have in our life that is any more important than the presence of God is. Not our livelihood, not our home, not our possessions, listen to me, not even our family is as important to us as the presence of God is. And let me just challenge you, because the presence of God is so important, we need to make sure that we safeguard and protect the presence of God in our lives greater than we protect anything else. Listen to me. We put our money in the bank so no one will take it. We put our possessions in a lockbox so that they're secure. There's nothing more important than the presence of God that needs to be guarded and protected any more than the presence of God within our lives. But the message was, follow the presence of God. Let me ask you this morning, what are you following? Who are you following? The only thing we're supposed to be following is follow after the presence of God. If you and I want to enjoy the fullness of God's promise, we're going to have to be in a pursuit after his presence. Because God says, you've never been this way before. Now listen to me. I, I shared with you that Moses sent spies out to spy out this land 40 years earlier, and that's true. But even those two spies, those 12 spies had not been this way before. When, they, when Moses sent the 12 spies out in Numbers chapter 13, he sent them from south to north over land. When Joshua sends out these two spies, he sends them east to west. He sends them over the Jordan, a place that they had not been before. And he says, follow after the ark because you don't know where you're going. 
Listen to me this morning, church, when I tell you each and every single day of your life and mine, we do not know where we're going. Every day of our life, we don't know what's going to happen. The truth of the matter is we've never passed this way before. Someone asked my last birthday, how do you feel being 62? I said, I don't know. I've never been 62 before. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. The truth of the matter is, we've never been this way before, church. You and I may wake up to a whole different world in the morning. Even though the world doesn't wake up to it, you may wake up to it, I may wake up to it, to a way that we've never been before. And listen to me when I tell you, we have never, ever needed the presence of God to be leading our life and following Him like we need to be doing today. The second phrase there is, but keep a distance, he said, of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Listen to me. They were supposed to keep a distance of almost a half a mile. By some calculations, it was a half a mile, over a half a mile. Think about it. In the terrain that they were in. Listen to me when I tell you the presence of God is an awesome, awesome, amazing thing indeed you remember in the old testament men were struck dead for not handling the ark correctly god says keep your distance let me just remind you that the old testament is a foreshadow of the reality of the new and the old testament he's saying keep your distance in the old testament there was the veil that kept them out from the presence of god kept them outside stay away stay away but let me tell you that's not the case of the new testament the new testament is not stay away the new testament is draw near to me and i will draw near to you hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 therefore brother since we have this confidence let us enter the most holy place of god by the blood of Jesus Christ. Second message is not only to follow after his presence, but the second message is found in verse 5. Look there with me. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. That word consecrate literally means separate, set apart yourselves unto God so that God can do amazing things in you. Let me just tell you something. I believe one of the things that keeps God from doing amazing things in most all of our lives is the fact that we fail to separate ourselves and set ourselves apart. Listen to me. It's not always all about sin. It it goes much deeper than just setting ourselves apart from sin. Set ourselves apart unto God. Listen to me when I tell you, not only can sin keep you from experiencing the power of God's presence, but let me tell you, good things can keep you from experiencing the power of God's presence too. And God says, if you want to experience amazing things, you must separate yourselves. You must set yourselves apart. Just like the priests were set apart from everybody else. Just like all the utensils they used in the temple was set apart and holy to be used for nothing else. Just like the holy of holies was set apart and only the high priest could go in and only he once a year. Israel and you and I need to have our lives set apart from this world world there's something about us today that we want to still serve god but we want to live like the world and act like the world and think like the world listen to me when i tell you you will never you and i will never enter the fullness of god's promise in our life until we're willing to set ourselves apart that means be different That means be a peculiar people that are set apart. That's the second message. Third message is found in verse 23. And that message is that God is no respecter of person. Look what he says in verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. Over. 
Let me remind you of the promise that God made to Joshua in the beginning, chapter 1. We won't take time to go back, but verse 5, he says, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So what does God say in verse 23? Just like I dried up the Red Sea for Moses so that he and the Israelites could cross over, I'm going to dry up the Jordan's flooded banks so that you and Israel can go across. Uh, Listen to me. I want to tell you something. What God has done for others, he will do for you and I if we will believe. Third, not only do I want you to see the miracles that were promised, the message that was proclaimed, but the memory that propels go to joshua chapter 4 with me now if you will please joshua chapter 4 and verse 4 the memory that propels so joshua called together the 12 men and he appointed from the israelites one from each tribe and said to them go over before the ark of the lord your god into the middle of the jordan Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israelites. To serve, listen, to serve as a sign among you. In the future when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed Jordan, The waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. God tells Joshua, before the ark comes out of the middle of the Jordan, send one man from every one of the 12 tribes of Israel and pick up a stone and put it on his shoulder and bring it to the side of the bank of the Jordan and put it there and pile them one on top of another. And this will be a memorial Unto you, a sign of remembrance of what the Lord your God has done for you. Listen to me when I tell you there may be many reasons why God has worked past victories in our life. But let me tell you one of the reasons is because God wants the victory of today to be the motivation of tomorrow. So God wants the victory of today to be what moves us tomorrow. Victory upon victory upon victory upon victory, our faith needs to be built. And Joshua says, I don't want you to ever forget. You can follow through Israel's history. Many times throughout Israel's history, God gave them that very same command. Command concerning the word of God. Command concerning crossing over Jordan. Again and again and again, he wanted to make sure that they never forgot. And aren't we very capable of forgetting, church? How many times in my own life Have I come against a storm? I've come against a trial. I've come against a test. And I felt like I'd never been there before. I I felt sorry for myself. It's never been this bad. It's never been this great. And yet when I make myself think back, I can think of multitudes of times I felt the very same way, way back down there somewhere. We forget. We forget that the God who brought us through yesterday is still the God of today. And he will forever be the God of tomorrow. God says to the people, make sure when you cross over that you don't forget. Can I tell you that you and I need to remember the miracles God has promised? We need to remember the message that he has proclaimed And we need to experience the memory that will propel us across the Jordan and into God's blessing. But I want you to look at verse 24 because that's why I want to leave you this morning. Close this message entitled, It's Time to Cross Over, by leaving you with this thought in verse number 24 of that fourth chapter. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might 
always fear the Lord your God. God could have done this miracle a multitude of different ways. He did it the way he did it because he wanted all the earth to know that he is God. Listen to me when I tell you, we not only shortchange God when we fail to give him glory, we shortchange ourselves in the process. When God works in our lives, we need to make sure that this world knows he's God. It's all about him, not about us. It's about his promise. It's about his possession that he wants to work in our lives. It's all about him. And listen to me, the plan of God becomes short-circuited when you and I fail to give him the glory and the honor that is rightly due to his name. I'm going to ask our musicians to come.